Good morning, delegates. Welcome to session one, performance of parliaments. Uh, this session will be will uh, comprise two virtual addresses. So for those in the chamber, you'll be watching uh, on the screens available. And um, hello to our online participants. It is fabulous to have you here. Before we start, um, I'm just going to talk about submitting questions uh, for those speakers. So all participants can submit questions via the live Q&A function on your mobile app uh, or from the conference portal on your device. There's a Q&A uh, button on your conference portal. You can submit those questions anytime during the presentation. If you're submitting questions electronically, I will select uh, the questions and ask them on behalf of online delegates during the Q&A question and answer session after the presentation. Uh, for those of you in person, you <clears throat> may seek the call uh, to ask a question in the Q&A session and you'll need to come to the podium at the table of the house. Is there a podium? Yeah. Okay, good. Um, if there's more than one question from the floor, uh, please line up in order um, so that you can be called. Please pause at the table and wait for the red light on the microphone to come on before speaking and state your name and jurisdiction. Papers will be available on the conference website after they've been given. So uh, our first uh, presentation in session 1A, as I said, is a virtual address uh, and that will be provided by the Honourable Joy Birch. Joy is the Speaker of the Legislative Assembly uh, in the uh, ACT. She was first elected to the Legislative Assembly in 2008 and has served on a number of committees and, then, and has held several ministerial positions. She served as Deputy Speaker, becoming Speaker of the Legislative Assembly for the Australian Capital Territory in October 2016. Since February this year, she's been acting chairperson of the CPA Small Branches, following the resignation of the previous CPA Small Branches chairperson, the Honourable Nikki Rattle from the Cook Islands. Joy was at the, at the time the vice chairperson of the CPA Small Branches Steering Committee, so assumed the role of acting CPA Small Branches chairperson until the next CPA Small Branches uh, conference. Today, Joy will be speaking about law in the time of corona, optimising parliamentary functions during long-term crises. Welcome uh, to the Honourable Joy Birch. Thank you indeed, and it's a pleasure to join friends and colleagues again in WA whilst I'm based here in Canberra. I'm sure that you will have a wonderful uh, CPA conference over on the west side. May I start with our traditional acknowledgement of country. Darawa nuna darawa nanawal. Narawari duni manyan nanawalweri darawalweri. Nengindi dindi darawa narawalbun injimara lejinyin. We started a traditional acknowledgement here in the assembly about 18 months ago, and I'm very pleased to be the first parliament in the Australian to do that. But as you know, we're here presenting papers, and my paper today is The Law in the Time of Corona, Optimising Parliamentary Functions During Long-Term Crisis. And I'd outline how the ACT Assembly approached parliamentary functions and oversight during the COVID-19 pandemic. As lawmakers, you have the lived experience and you know that legislating in the best of times is an exercise of diligence and persistence. But in times of crisis, it does test the mettle of even the most experienced parliamentarians. 
While experience shows it's conventional for parliaments to yield greater power to the executive governments during crisis. This works for the short term, but it is unsustainable to maintain this imbalance of power over a longer term crisis such as pandemics. It's valuable just to reflect briefly on what is it about long term that lead to these challenges. Parliaments are well versed in dealing with emergencies. So what made COVID-19 different? I believe the source of the issue lays in the distinction between response and recovery. In the short term crisis, the incident begins and ends quickly. The immediate impact is obvious. There is a prompt and distinct shift from response to recovery. This allows a clear reset of temporary authority that was yielded to the executive government, restoring effectively the balance of power. By contrast, though, long-term crises such as COVID-19 are drawn out over weeks and months and the impact continues to evolve. The changing and extended nature of these emergencies blur the line between response and recovery, often requiring them to occur at the same time. The blurring and the absence of a distinct end to the response period is unclear when to restore the pre-crisis balance of power. I'd like to share our experience in supporting parliamentary function and oversight without jeopardizing, without jeopardizing though, the executive's capacity to respond. I'll do this in reference to three unique challenges that parliaments face during these long-term emergencies. That is executive overreach, legislating by delegation, and the technocratic accountability. Let's look at executive overreach. The reason for yielding authority to the executive governments during long-term crises is to enable them to respond effectively. For parliaments, this sometimes includes relaxing the rigid norms of the executive parliamentary divide, along with complying with the government's directions issued as part of the crisis response. This is an exercise in solidarity. It can also be seen as institutional acceptance opening the doors to government over overreach and blurring the separation of powers. While this may seem alarmist, if unchecked, such overreach can evolve into executive aggrandizement, where governments consolidate their increased authority and weaken the checks and balances. The main casualty in this is parliamentary scrutiny and oversight, which can be discreetly curtailed by closing the parliament or limiting its operations. Parliaments therefore require responsive measures which allow them to function effectively during crisis while limiting the potential for executive overreach. One important way is preserving the capacity for the parliaments to sit during these emergencies. While business continuity plans are common for parliaments, these are often best suited for short-term responses such as security threats and natural disasters. What became clear during COVID-19 was the protracted nature presented a different set of challenges. This became most visible for us when our assembly sat during the first wave in 2020. For this period, the assembly agreed that only members, we were a parliament of 25, so only 13 members would occupy the chamber, attend divisions and participate in question time. Question time was also arranged so that only ministers who were there to answer questions could be present, the opposition having to give notice about which ministers they wished to ask a question of. There were no government backbench questions were asked. Parts at the table were split between two separate and different desks. Later, when all 25 members were permitted in the chamber at the same time and to maintain appropriate physical distancing, we utilised open space near the public galleries to seat six of our MLAs and installed a temporary podium so those members could speak. A pair of tables were retrofitted to the central leaders table and that provided the capacity for all 25 members to attend in the chamber. It became clear that these temporary measures, though, were not necessarily temporary as the COVID-19 continued. The new MLA benches commissioned soon had microphones added, the temporary podium was removed and an acrylic divider was installed between the clerks at the table so they could come back and sit together. These changes allowed all members to participate in sittings at even the most restricted level of physical distancing. 
Recently, with a Delta variant outbreak, we confirmed a new requirement to wear a mask in the chamber and installed an acrylic divider at the central leaders table, and that added a further layer of protection to the proceedings. The ACT Assembly has also changed its sitting patterns in response to COVID-19, with government, opposition and crossbenchers agreeing to new dates but with a minimum loss of sitting time. A number of private members' motions have been maintained and that was critical to the agreement from government and opposition alike. For parliaments that are unable to reform their formats or to, to rechange the physical nature of their chambers, conducting proceedings on traditional mediums is an alternative. Access to new digital technologies makes it easier for parliaments to perform their core functions without having to meet physically, either at all or in part. While many hands have been wrung over the implications of digitising parliaments, the COVID-19 pandemic has shown the value of embracing the non-traditional technologies. As noted in my paper, such challenges and solutions ought not to be used as an excuse to deny members and parliaments their constitutional rights and obligations to carry out their functions. As we were able to reformat our chamber, our assembly hasn't had to use remote voting or conduct sitting with mixed or full virtual participation. And I'm aware that many other parliaments have. As we all know, the parliamentary chambers are not only the place of accountability, our committees have successfully shifted to conducting virtual meetings and hearings, allowing standing committees to continue to scrutinise the government. It ensures that the focus of the crisis doesn't lead to the limited oversight of policy and decisions that would be subject to parliamentary process in normal circumstances. These are already the detailed inquiry arm of our parliament. Meeting virtually allows them to continue to compel and question, regardless of whether the executive closes parliament or not. Now, turning to legislation by delegation. Governments rely on increased legislative powers delegated to them during crisis. The so-called emergency power executive to make and amend regulations and directions outside of the normal parliamentary legislative process. The existence of a second legislative stream outside of a parliament during extended emergency is conflicting and complicated and difficult. Parliaments therefore need to be creative in using the tools they have available to provide scrutiny of these measures, which by reason of the crisis and the prior to delegation, would not be normally passed in Parliament. Using the existing committee processes provides an opportunity for scrutiny, as does establishing specialist or select committees. During the pandemic, the Assembly established two select committees into the Territory's response. The first committee was established in April of last year, shortly after its first lockdown. It had five members, two government, two opposition, and one from the crossbench. The committee was chaired by the leader of the opposition. Over its life, the committee had 21 hearings, produced four interim reports, made 40 recommendations before dissolving before the 2020 territory elections. The second select committee was established in September of this year during the first sitting after the ACT entered its second lockdown period. It has a member of government, a member of opposition, a member of the crossbench, and again is chaired by the leader of the opposition. In addition to performing parliament scrutiny function for the delegated crisis legislation, these committees also invited public submissions, heard from individuals and communities about the impact of the government's response. This provided members with a holistic overview and allowed the result to come in responsive and informed recommendations. For the most part, the pandemic's response committees have enjoyed a robust, but indeed a collaborative relationship with the executive government. Now we accept that there is no silver bullet solution that balances the executive's need to respond and for the need for oversight. It is, however, important that we as parliamentarians continue to explore the possible 
possibility and the possible solutions to ensure that appropriate balances between informed decision making and democratic legitimacy. Now, moving to technocratic accountability. Long-term crises such as communicable disease outbreaks, natural disasters and an extended civil unrest are characteristically technical. As such, it is common for ministers and specialist public officials to be empowered to lead the technical response. Understandably, there is increased public and political interest in expert-led and informed decision during such emergencies. Not before COVID-19 had I heard almost on a daily basis from politicians, government and non-government alike, a reference to them taking advice, being supported in their decision making by an expert uh, panel or an expert individual. To be clear, I greatly value and respect and appreciate the expertise that have contributed to shaping ACT's response to the COVID-19 pandemic. The challenge Place, though, is how to hold ministers and expert officials accountable for decisions that they make without hampering their capacity to do so effectively. Requiring regular reports of decisions and the rationale is one way that we can be that can be achieved. And the logic behind that is simple: those who are delegated increase legislative powers during crisis accountable for its use in a way which is comparable to if a parliament itself were exercising those powers. There are a range of mechanisms available to do this, including specialist committees, as I've discussed earlier. In addition to this, the ACT Assembly legislated a requirement for a report to be presented in the chamber every month for as long as the emergency powers were in use. This was added to the COVID-19 Emergency Response Act of 2020 by an opposition amendment in recognition of the reality that significant decisions need significant scrutiny. There have been 19 updates provided to the Assembly since the ACT's notification in April of last year, delivered through a ministerial statement. These have been valuable opportunities the rationale behind decisions and to offer an opportunity for the Assembly to discuss the ongoing response in a robust and constructive way. Another pre-pleasing practice has continued to evolve. Recently, the first human rights consideration statement from the Chief Health Officer presented to the Assembly by the Health Minister as part of the regular update. This addition to observations by the Pandemic Response Committee that health directions didn't re require statements addressing their compatibility to our Human Rights Act in the same way that legislation presented in the Assembly would. It's yet another example of how institutional flexibility can help optimise parliamentary accountability during these extended crises. So, just a short overview of some of the ways in which the ACT Parliament can optimise its functions during a long-term emergencies with reference to our own journey. Uh, but we know that each Parliament responds, how it will respond is unique to its political and constitutional realities. However, the challenges that our institutions face are shared. Though we here in the ACT are a young Parliament, I hope can be gleaned from our experience as a stronger, more resilient parliaments make for stronger and more resilient democracy. I will leave my paper there. It's a shortened version of what is in your papers, but I'm happy to move to question time. And I will be joined by my clerk, Mr. Tom Duncan, who's wearing a very dapper hat because it is Melbourne Cup and he's already ran a few sweeps um, and he will be distracted come about three o'clock, I suggest. But happy to take questions, Madam Chair. Mr. Duncan. Hello, Mr. Duncan. <laughs> and happy Melbourne Cup Day to you, <laughs> sir. Thank you. Um, uh, thank you very much, Joy, for um, a, a very um, detailed oversight uh, of uh, the arrangements in the ACT. Um, and I think you've given all of us some um, uh, particular ideas for our own jurisdiction. 
are there delegates are there any questions either coming from online or from the chamber that members would like to put to joy uh -huh. thank you the honorable michelle o'burn if you wanted to come to the lectern or oh, to the table is it to the table. I Thanks. just really wanted to comment on Tom's hat. <laughs> <laughs> Putting the fact that he's wearing black on black to a side. Um, I was actually interested in the human rights um, submission that was made to the parliament. We haven't done anything along those lines. So have you got any, um, any detail or any information around whether that was something that was uh, simply an update or whether there was an opportunity to debate it and how it informed any other policy decisions? Thanks, Michelle. Go ahead, Joy. Yeah, no, thank you, Michelle. Um, we, we have a Human Rights Act here and any uh, bill that's presented, any legislation that's presented has an accompanying human rights statement. But through the emergency powers and if all this, this you know, delegated response through uh, alternate powers, that was not um, necessary or needed or accommodated. And it became very clear, particularly through the second select committee, that any other bit of law direction would have to have that. If it was presented to Parliament as a routine bit of business, it would come with a human rights compatibility statement. And so hence, there was um, quite a vigorous non-executive position to say the executive should accommodate including uh, in its regular statements a human rights compatibility to any new direction. I don't know if that answers your question, Michelle, Tom. Uh, yeah. Michelle is nodding that it has, but Tom, if you'd like to contribute to that, of course you're oh, welcome. No, I think Madam Speaker has answered perfectly. Okay, thank you. Um, members, are there any further questions? There's nothing coming in online. We have one. We have one from online. Ah, Senator Sue Lyons, hello to you. Um, Senator Lyons has said, some of the key principles Joy outlined are similar to the arrangements we've made in the Commonwealth Parliament. Do we think our responses across Australia's parliaments have been similar? Noting, of course, there are some quite distinct elements which the ACT has enacted that the Commonwealth has not. So the question from Senator Lyons is, do we think our responses across Australia's parliament have been similar? Joy, um, who, who'd I, like I, to respond I, to I, that? Gonna, I'll take the, the yes and the no um, response to that, and I will defer to Tom as well. Because of we were able to get our 25 members in, by nature of being a small jurisdiction and a small parliament, we could accommodate that. But I'm very much aware federally, for example, that um, it is routine for them to operate from a mix of virtual and in presence uh, participation in debate. But if I'm not mistaken, recent debates in the House of Reps as is their agreement and standard practice. I'm not saying it was unusual, but those that were virtual not able to participate in vote, yet there's a different arrangement in the Senate, is my understanding. Virtually, virtually attending the Senate, you can still vote, but the arrangements are if you're virtually ascending the House of Reps, you'll, you cannot vote. Um, I think it is something that is worthy of a discussion broadly um, beyond this Q&A for parliaments across Australia to consider how, how, what is the uniform response to that. And it goes to one of the comments in my paper is about you, you, could, you can get fix it, you can get workarounds, but none of those workarounds should underscore or take away the legitimate obligations of members of parliament to participate and vote. Okay. Uh, yes, Senator Lyons, I just wanted to respond by drawing attention to the last uh, paragraph of Madam Speaker's paper where she says, um, well, how each legislature responds is unique to constitutional realities. And I think you point out quite correctly that uh, parliaments have responded differently um, because they have different political and constitutional realities across Australia. And um, so 
Yes, we, we've done it a certain way, but um, we're a unicameral parliament, a small parliament. We were able to expand the size of our chamber to fit all our members. We were able to establish those two select committees chair. Other parliaments have, haven't been able to do that for various reasons, but um, yeah, so there are there are going to be different responses, I guess, all across Australia to how, how they deal with the pandemic. And through our lockdowns, while we've lost some sitting time, it's actually we've got it to a minimal. And part of that arrangement was, um, you know, supporting the opposition to maintain their um, private members debate opportunities as well, which was which they consider a key element of keeping the executive to account. Thanks. I, I think you've uh, given us some uh, Im important insights into how you've operated and some of the, uh, I, I guess, key questions. Um, Senator Sue Lyons has uh, responded about voting rights in particular, and I know that some other jurisdictions are looking to um, the federal parliament in relation to uh, participation in particular voting rights. Senator Lyons has said, um, remote participation has strict rules. There is no voting and limited rights. Uh, no, there is no difference in the voting rights in the Senate. Okay, so, I stand corrected, I apologise. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's it's hard to keep track, isn't it, of, of across, across all of uh, what is happening across all of our jurisdictions. But uh, you have provided some really important um, uh, understandings for us in terms of your process and the, the key things that we as parliamentarians need to take into account in times of crisis and otherwise. Uh, are, are there any further questions? Uh, the Honourable Jackie Jarvis, come who's uh, on the floor so she'll come to the speaker's stand go ahead uh so my question was obviously we we have a system of government where we we allow the executive you know in times of caretaker period to to keep government ticking along um and i certainly know that um you know in the past when that period might have gone longer because of a hung parliament the the general consensus from the electorate seems to be that it just ticks along quite nicely without um, any of us politicians involved. Did you have a timeline in, in, in mind as to when you needed to have these in place or, or did you have a, a playbook or was it just um, sort of uh, yeah, try to implement things as you went along? Um, we were responding, so the original emergency powers would have ha would have had a time period attached, and then as the pandemic and the situation evolved, it it rolled through. As um, how we accommodated moving virtually, is you know the public health orders in many ways just dictated the necessity to keep on doing that, and so it was a bit of um, working progress. Uh, we had to move. We only having 13 members in the chamber was not going to satisfy everyone all the time. So we t put temporary seats in and the temporary podium. And my comment is, you know, temporary arrangements have now almost become a permanent arrangement within within the chamber. Tom? Well, the only thing I'd, I'd add is that uh, there was a territory election in the middle of the whole pandemic, which sort of, that's the reason why we had two select committee and then the territory election came along, so obviously that was dissolved. And we've now re-established uh, another select committee, given the length of the of the pandemic. But yes, and but we still managed to sort of maintain all those reports that Madam Speaker mentioned to to the chamber about how the emergency powers have been used. So there has been that regular reporting mechanism across the, the whole period of time, notwithstanding the, the territory election. Excellent. Thank you. Uh, are there any further questions from the floor or I'm just checking online? You don't want to know his tip for the race? <laughs> 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 Michelle O'Byrne has texted her tip, I understand. Oh, we, we, we need a response back, please, Tom. Uh, and just for the record, mine is Tralee Rose. Thank you. Well, my money's on the favourite number two, so. <laughs> okay. Okay, we might wrap up then um, if uh, if there are no further questions, including tips.
thank you both very much for um, your insights, your participation, and um, particularly your virtual participation. It's been, as the first uh, presenters, you've shown us how to do it. Thank you very much. Right. Thanks. Look forward to the next couple of days. Thank you indeed. Okay, let me just check, members, uh, how we're going for just running a minute or two ahead of time. I just wanted to make sure that we... Ah, I know what it is. The chamber clocks are different from the real time. Huh. Uh, and the chamber clocks are uh, a, minute um, a minute behind the rest of the world. So we move to session 1B, uh, which is another virtual address. And following the virtual address, we'll again have a question and answer uh, session. This um, presentation is from the Honourable Adam Sewell, who's a member of the Legislative Council in New South Wales. Adam has been a member of the Legislative Council in New South Wales since 2011. In 2000, uh, he commenced practising law as a barrister. He's still a member of the New South Wales Bar Association and continues to practice as a barrister, providing pro bono legal advice and representation in public interest litigation, particularly matters involving claims for asylum. Today, uh, the Honourable Adam Sir will talk about the accountability of government during COVID-19 pandemic. And there you are, magically appearing on our screens. Adam, it's good to see you. Uh, so, um, please, um, Adam, would you like to commence your address on the accountability of government during COVID-19 pandemic? Thank you. Uh, yep, yeah, I'd certainly like to uh, commence by uh, recognising that I am today on the lands of the Darragan Gundungurra peoples uh, in the Blue Mountains west of Sydney. Um, and I'd like to pay my respects to their elders past and present and emerging. Um, the way in which these presentations are being given is very, I think, symptomatic of the time of COVID where uh, online platforms and Zoom meetings seem to be the order of the day uh, rather than in person, uh, which of course is regrettable. But I think the, the existence and availability of technology uh, to assist us uh, is certainly better than nothing. The topic that I'll be speaking about is very similar to Joy's, but from a slightly different perspective, focusing on the accountability issue. Now, governments are elected to office for limited periods of time, and they're given enormous powers and authorities, but periodic elections by themselves don't make a democracy or even a liberal democracy as we like to think of it. Between elections, if governments are to work as well as they can, they must be open to scrutiny. Of course, that's by the parliament through mechanisms such as question time, the work of committees, analysis and making of legislation, and of course, by the community being able to interact with their elected officials and being able to meet with them and try and persuade them about matters of public affairs. But of course, we mustn't forget the media. Without a strong and functioning media, governments can also quite easily escape scrutiny. And all of these things, of course, have been, I think, significantly impacted by COVID. Um, obviously, the adjournment of parliaments, coupled with the transfer of executive decision makings to ministers, does heighten the risk of both corruption and poor decision making, as well as limiting the ability of members of parliament to fully represent their constituents. Uh, and of course, uh, constituents being able to interact with their elected representatives. So there is a risk of poor decision making or possibly worse through this concentration of executive power. However, um, focusing that power in the hands of the executive at times of crisis is inevitable if we're to keep government working. So it's getting that balance right uh, is quite important. Um, now, one of the uh, the impact, of course, of COVID on the community has been significant. It has enormously impacted the way individuals, communities, businesses and governments work. Uh, obviously, for, for those who have retained their work, there has been increased hours of work, increases in unpaid work, 
Uh, for example, the Centre for, Center for Future Work has, a sta has a, assessed that uh, the unpaid work of Australians has extended from six weeks unpaid work last year to nearly seven weeks of unpaid overtime this year. That's nearly $100 billion worth of uh, additional work uh, that people have performed but not been paid for. We've also seen the intensification of work, more output being expected without any increases in remuneration. And of course, because of technology, we've got this continued blurring of the dividing line between work and personal and family time driven by new, new technologies. And of course, compounded by the fact that those who retained their work were performing so much of that work or even exclusively at home. That is, they weren't so much working from home, but really living at work. And we see reports of the social and mental health impacts of this uh, being quite significant. Of course, we won't get a proper appreciation of that over time, um, but uh, nevertheless, it is very real, as I'm sure all of you talking to friends and neighbours and children uh, will appreciate. At the same time, uh, there have been people who have lost their work. Uh, there have been significant downturns in key industries like construction uh, and retail and others. Um, and we have seen, at least in New South Wales, the concentration of those job losses in West and Southwest and Sydney, which have also been the COVID hotspot areas. And th those regions have lost a quarter of a million jobs during the lockdown period over the last year. That's uh, a very significant uh, impact. Uh, these areas have been the subject of the greater uh, restrictions on mobility during the pandemic. Uh, and of course, uh, that comes with uh, a, a significant psychological impact as well. At the same time, we can't be ignorant of the impact on the media landscape. Uh, we've seen saturation coverage by the media of COVID during last year. Uh, up to 80% of all media stories at different times were COVID related. And this has been reinforced by political leaders having daily press conferences with their chief health officers. And these daily press conferences have become a, a key source of information for both the media and the community. Um, I don't know whether anyone can see it. I'm happy to provide the link later, but there's a very good uh, paper put together by the media monitoring company Stream and, of course, the News and Media Research Centre at the University of Canberra looking at covering COVID-19, how the Australian media reported the coronavirus pandemic in 2020. And the uptake of or the, the summary of that is that political leaders, health experts and jo journalists all worked together to really promote health news about the pandemic. Uh, unlike, for example, in America, there was a very strong consensus amongst health officials public officials, governments of all stripes, and the media about the need to deal with the pandemic resolutely. Uh, and this has really seen a lot of media uh, perform a sort of civic journalism role, uh, loyal facilitators of health information. Um, but this does seem to have come at a cost of the role of the media as a watchdog. There has been a, a narrowing of the range of political issues at least initially covered by the media, a lack of interest in political reporting of you of the genuine of the of the usual cut and thrust of politics. But that then seems to ease come August of last year. And then when we look at what's happened since, uh, using uh, the media company I sent his reports to the New South Wales Parliament, we can see that COVID has settled down to comprising about 20% of all media reports. Um, so far less than the 80% it reached last year. Um, but what we have therefore seen, I think, is um, a real focusing on health, promoting health solutions, promoting the public health orders uh, where there have been restrictions on people's ability to move um, in order to really tackle and deal with the pandemic, which I think is a really good thing. But it does seem to have come at a cost of the breadth of reporting on usual political issues. And you've seen in New South Wales, the opposition of which I'm a part, took the view that we would very much support the government 
in terms of meeting the public health crisis, which meant uh, a, a lot, uh, a reduction in the usual partisan disputation. Um, there were other things as well, such as Parliament not meeting as much, uh, which I will come to in a moment. Um, now, obviously, at some point in time, uh, that will resume, and it, it, it is already. Um, but the impact on key institutions like the Parliament shows that it hasn't been immune from the impacts of the pandemic. We've seen uh, parliaments uh, not making laws, not necessarily controlling state finances as much as they used to, giving the executive uh, a huge, uh, uh, enormous additional authority, often through legislation. Uh, in New South Wales, for example, we we saw a reduction in the sittings of the parliament by about 20%. And I think uh, the federal parliament uh, reduced its sittings uh, by about 30%. Now, uh, this is not quite as bad as during the Spanish flu pandemic where the parliament of New South Wales didn't meet for eight months. Um, however, there has been a longer gap than usual between sittings, but we've been able to use changes to practice and procedure and technology to enable uh, our parliament to keep doing its work. Now, the New South Wales Parliament's research service has done a, a very useful brief on how the parliament has adapted um, to, to that, um, and that link can be provided. But what we see is uh, in, in New South Wales, not only do we have lesser sittings, but in the lower house, I think similar to the ACT, we had a situation where there were fewer members in the chamber, only about 23, um, and the public was not allowed in. Uh, in the upper house where I sit, we did we were able to uh, keep, again, a, a smaller number of people through a representative sample, working with the government as well as the opposition through pairing. Uh, this was made more difficult with the crossbench in both houses uh, because in the New South Wales Parliament, the crossbench are not part of the pairing arrangements. And this has really made uh, that uh, discussion enlivened again. Um, I believe in the Senate, in, in, in the Commonwealth Parliament, there is pairing involving crossbenches. Uh, the government in New South Wales has been traditionally resistant uh, to doing that. But nevertheless, I think uh, the time to do that uh, uh, has, has come upon us. Uh, as I said, we, we lost about 20% of our sitting days uh, last year. Uh, the New South Wales Upper House uh, did recall the Parliament for a day, uh, uh, for three days last year in, in September, uh, but that was pursuant to new arrangements that the opposition and crossbench had put in place. So we felt that the period between parliamentary sittings had become too great and there were significant matters of public interest that needed to be discussed. And so we, we did use those mechanisms to recall the House for those three days. Uh, the lower House, of course, being controlled by the government of the day, uh, did not do so. This year, we've also seen uh, during this additional lockdown, more days lost, but there is a, uh, an intention to try and do uh, catch ups later in the year. Uh, by sitting additional days, sitting uh, on Fridays, for example. Um, in terms of some of the particular mechanisms uh, that have been mentioned by Joy, um, we in New South Wales didn't move to a hybrid model. We were going to uh, in uh, September of this year, at least for the upper house, uh, having a combination of members coming in person uh, and some members being able to participate virtually. Um, but that didn't happen because the government decided that the risks of COVID were so great that it wouldn't sit the lower house. In the upper house, uh, our, our rules required that at least one government minister or parliamentary secretary uh, must be present in order for the house to meet, and the government did not provide one of those, so we were not able to meet uh, uh, the upper house has since remedied uh, that arrangement, and that is no longer. Well, that requirement is still in place, but it can be can be abrogated. So we've got a situation where we didn't get to do uh, the hybrid uh, model that is seen elsewhere. I believe the the Senate, the House of Representatives, and the Victorian Legislative Assembly, as well as the UK House of Commons, did adopt various forms of of hybrid models of sitting. 
um, in in the United Kingdom, for example, that didn't just extend to a hybrid chamber, but extended to proxy voting, where members allowed a colleague to vote on their behalf through, for example, through the the party whips, as well as the use of social distancing. Uh, different versions of this, I think, we've seen in the Scottish Parliament and in the Welsh Senate, where you've got at different times, there's either been less attendees in the chamber in person, uh, there's been proxy voting, and eventually both in, in those two devolved parliaments, they have developed a system of permitting members to not just participate virtually, but are also being able to vote uh, online. Now, last year, during as we emerged from the lockdown, there was a lot of discussion in the New South Wales Parliament about whether we should develop mechanisms for virtual sittings. Um, our Constitution Act requires members to be present, uh, and it wasn't clear, at least to us, whether or not that meant physically present. Uh, Crown solicitor's advice was provided that uh, suggested, although the matter wasn't free of doubt, the better view was probably that uh, present meant physically present, and therefore, if we were to have virtual parliaments in New South Wales, that would require some constitutional uh, change or amendment. Um, I believe Anne Toomey has suggested at the, at the Commonwealth level uh, that may not be the case and that maybe the federal parliament could implement a system of virtual uh, voting as well as participation. Um, in the Victorian Legislative Assembly, I believe uh, their clerk obtained legal advice indicating that the standing orders could be amended to permit virtual participation, including voting based upon a, a quite a liberal interpretation of the meaning of the word present in the Victorian Constitution Act. But I'm told and I understand that there's not much interest, uh, at least across the major parties, in acting on, on, the, on those two things. So I think that's a situation where uh, that's it's uh, we've got a situation where it's just not clear, uh, at least in New South Wales, whether we could implement a virtual parliament without changes. There was no interest last year because I think there there was the view and uh, and the hope that once we had merged from lockdown, this wouldn't be necessary again. Um, unfortunately, the lockdown this year has shown uh, that those hopes were, were misplaced and we did have a further lockdown period. Um, so this is a matter that the, current, the parliament is currently debating um, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Apart from a virtual a parliament, the other mechanisms that we've adopted, um, our committees uh, used to have a situation where members, some members could phone in and participate virtually through uh, online platforms as long as the chair or the person chairing it was physically in the building. Um, last year in the first uh, pandemic outbreak, we did change our standing orders in each house to enable uh, parliamentary committees in both houses to uh, operate virtually uh, entirely. And there have been a number of hearings both last year and this year involving virtual hearings. Um, just for example, in uh, a few months ago when we had our first round of budget estimates uh, processes, they were entirely virtual with witnesses and members participating virtually. Um, there were no ministers present at those times. Uh, in the most recent round of budget estimates occurring last week and this week, uh, they were in person in the parliamentary precinct with limited attendance uh, with many p witnesses uh, online and some members participating uh, online. Um, uh, as Joy mentioned <clears throat> in terms of what happened in the ACT and inspired in part, I think, at the time by what had happened in New Zealand, the New South Wales Parliament or the New South Wales Upper House, uh, we used our Public Accountability Committee to uh, repurpose that into a COVID oversight committee, um, looking at the way in which different arms of government were handling and dealing with the pandemic. And there were a number of uh, hearings last year uh, and this year looking at uh, various issues like health, education, uh, treasury and financial policy, uh, better regulation and planning issues, uh, because one of the mechanisms the government was using to stimulate, were trying to stimulate the economy, 
was through uh, accelerated planning approvals, and these were all subject to scrutiny through the uh, COVID oversight hearings of the Public Accountability Committee. Uh, that committee hasn't uh, delivered any reports yet, and unlike in New Zealand, and I think Joy indicated the ACT, um, this committee established by the New South Wales Upper House will continue till the end of this year, and it was always intended to be open-ended on the basis that uh, we, while we hoped that the pandemic would come to an end sooner, uh, there was a very there was a concern that it may not, and unfortunately that has proven to be uh, quite uh, quite the case. Uh, like in the ACT, the New South Wales Parliament last year and this year have passed a number of uh, laws that have given additional in, uh, authority to the executive to make decisions without uh, returning to Parliament or parliamentary scrutiny. Obviously, this is not desirable, but possibly necessary to ensure that uh, government continues to work, but it does represent a very significant shift of power from Parliament to the executive. And I know, at least in the federal context, the Centre for Public Integrity has said that this is a, a concerning development and certainly that uh, is something that we do need to, uh, to uh, keep a watchful eye on. We also passed legislation enabling the Treasurer to, uh, without returning to Parliament and without the delivery of an annual budget to uh, make necessary expenditures. Again, not a desirable situation, but one that was necessary in the circumstances where our annual budget last year was uh, delayed for several months. But we wanted to make sure that the ordinary operations of government and government policies uh, were able to keep being pursued and implemented, not just to make sure that government kept working, but to, tr to not stymie the government's efforts to stimulate the economy. Uh, obviously, looming over everything have been, in all jurisdictions have been the use of public health orders. Uh, these have been enormously important in uh, helping to uh, educate and direct the community about what how it should be behaving to deal with the pandemic. Um, in New South Wales, uh, these have uh, been varied very, very many times, and this has created enormous difficulties in understanding them by on the both but the part of the police force who have to implement them and the community that have to abide by them but although there has been some difficulty largely the community has embraced this and behaved appropriately as i said there are, have been some uh, divergences from this but largely the community and government have been able to work together and of course public health orders are not scrutinizable by parliament or able to be disallowed uh, which puts a, a heavy uh, authority, a heavy burden on the government to not overreach. Um, turning very briefly, and I will just conclude on this, to the issue of the virtual parliament, which of course looms large. The Greens uh, MP in the upper house, David Shoebridge, did introduce legislation to enable each house of parliament to adopt standing orders to implement a virtual parliament. Um, there was some debate and amendment in the upper house on that legislation. Um, One Nation moved a successful amendment to ensure that only video links would be used, audio visual links, not just people coming in by audio only. And this was because of concerns to ensure that only the member concerned spoke and was to vote. And the Labor Party also, of which I'm a part, put up an amendment which I moved, which uh, requires the presiding officer of the relevant house to determine that it would be impracticable for the House to meet due to an emergency, an emergency of a kind of a pandemic, a natural disaster, a terrorist attack, or the like, and also that there must be a majority of members consent to an audiovisual parliament. Uh, um, so that's a, a very important um, qualification because uh, even those who promote innovation do not want to divert from the, the default being parliament must meet and debate in person and vote in person these audio, these virtual mechanisms should only be invoked in an actual crisis when the only other real alternative is to have parliament uh, not meet at all the other thing i'll end on is that the shooters fishers and farmers party have put up a bill to provide for an independent model of funding 
our independent commission against corruption and other oversight bodies. Um, these oversight bodies have been locked in a dispute with the executive government over what is perceived to be inadequate funding by the executive of bodies that scrutinise it, including our anti-corruption body. Our Public Accountability Committee and our Auditor General have also said that these oversight bodies should have independent funding mechanisms rather than being dependent on the grace and favour of the government of the day. So that bill is also before the House. Um, and of course, those oversight bodies perform a vital role in providing scrutiny and accountability of government in New South Wales as the current ICAC inquiry into the actions of our former Premier, uh, which are currently underway, show. So I'll pull up stumps there and I'm happy to take uh, any questions. Uh, thanks, Adam. <clears throat> that was a, a really interesting contribution and pro provided us with some um, <clears throat> important insights into New South Wales that, um, um, well, to be honest, I wasn't aware of the detail that you had actually gone through in terms of your uh, uh, concerns around Parliament. Um, members, are there any questions either online and just a reminder that you can submit your questions either through the app or on your um, uh, online on the uh, virtual conference site, uh, there's a live Q&A uh, box there for you to submit those questions. Uh, first of all, I've got, I'll go to the conference uh, floor. Are there, are there any questions from the conference floor? Not yet. And have we got anything online yet? Just my question for test. Okay, no, no. Um, no uh, Sam, there is one coming Sam over, is there? Sam Hastings. Sam Hastings with you. Okay, attention. Sam Hastings uh, from the conference floor from Western Australia, Clark Assistant. Um, good afternoon, uh, Sam Hastings. I'm the Clark Assistant uh, House with the uh, WA Legislative Council. Um, I've got a question concerning scrutiny over in the Council uh, in New South Wales, um, your Standing Order 52 provides a process for the production of documents. Uh, and I'm just wondering to what extent uh, that has been used this year uh, and uh, whether you've seen an increase, for example, in relation to trying to access um, health advice or other things, and whether there's been a, a similar increase perhaps in the number of claims of privilege over such documents. Uh, look, thank you for that question. and. Um, yes, our upper house, I think both houses uh, have this power to call for state papers. In New South Wales, that power was long thought to have gone away until the late 90s when uh, the house compelled the government to produce documents. And uh, it really does only really work when the government of the day does not, either by itself or with its allies, have a, a, a majority in the upper house. In the current parliament, the constellation of opposition and crossbench parties significantly changed the way in which our house works. Uh, and the government has had to contend with uh, a significantly higher number of calls for papers in this parliament than in the previous parliaments in which I've served. And as in my former role as opposition leader in the upper house, I guess I was responsible for moving an awful lot of those calls yeah. for papers. Um, in response, however, the government has uh, increasingly resorted to blanket claims or, or very wide claims of privilege over significant amounts of the information produced. We have a process by which the House appoints an independent legal arbiter who takes submissions from government and from the member uh, who's uh, done the call for papers or any member who wishes to lodge a dispute over a claim of privilege and the arbiter then evaluates and makes a recommendation to the House. Um, with very few exceptions over the last 20 years, the House has abided by the views of the arbiter, uh, producing, uh, you know, well, recognising claims of privilege where the arbiter says they exist and uh, largely not recognising claims of privilege. Um, in my 10 years in the upper house, and I've engaged in many of these privilege disputes, um, the government generally loses because they don't really make proper claims of privilege. Their claims are really of the nature that 
they just don't want the information to be able to be discussed publicly. Um, sometimes there's commercial and confidence stuff that truly is commercially in confidence. Sometimes there's legal professional privilege, um, but nevertheless, largely those claims of privilege are not upheld. This has been a particular problem during the two pandemic lockdowns because in our system, the clerk of the upper house takes possession of the documents that have been produced where there's a claim of privilege, only members of the house may review that material in person. And of course, during the lockdowns, members have really been restricted in being able to come into parliament to review those documents. Although members uh, have been recognised as, as essential workers, many of us have felt reluctant to put the staff of the parliament at risk or indeed our own staff by coming in and to review these documents. So there was a large periods of time this year and last year where privileged material was not reviewed by members and that has delayed the processes of lodging disputes and having disputes determined and then having information brought into the public domain. So that is something that would be remedied if government would agree to producing calls for papers uh, electronically. Uh, there is currently negotiations underway between our Premier's Department and the Clerk of the Upper House but that process has been ongoing for many years. Uh, given that uh, banks, law firms and other institutions conduct transnational transactions worth billions of dollars using secure online platforms, it does beg a belief that the New South Wales government and parliament can't deal with privileged material in some kind of electronic platform where even under a claim of privilege, a member would be able to, from the comfort of his or her, own home, use a secure login to review that privileged material, but we're just not there yet. In terms of health advice, um, health advice upon which the government went into lockdown most recently uh, and the advice upon which it then emerged from lockdown has been called for by the Upper House, uh, but we have not yet seen that. Um, Adam, we've got a, a comment from Senator Sue Lyons that you may wish to respond to okay. um, online. No doubt you've been watching the Senate. Our OPD have increased and the rate of production has decreased. Oh. Uh, the scrutiny of government is critical in these times and yet we're so often frustrated with the response from government, including the claim of privilege. Um, uh, it is a, is a comment from Senator Lyons, um, but, but have you got a, a response to the comment? Yes, well, we, we've had a similar experience, not that the amount of material has been, has decreased, but the rate of production has slowed. So mm. obviously the House will set a time frame within which the government has to produce material. Uh, at different times, the government hasn't always been able to meet that deadline. And we had an informal process outside of the House sitting to uh, provide extensions, which were then recognised when the House uh, met. There's now a sessional order we've put in place that enables the member responsible for moving the call for papers to agree changed timetable with the government agencies. Again, they have to be ratified when the House sits again, but we have seen a significant increase in government agencies not only not meeting the deadline, but not meeting the deadlines without speaking to the relevant member or even the clerks to notify them uh, that there will be delays. And again, the government rationale is, well, it's COVID, there's less people working, uh, you know, in the workplace, and therefore that is slowing the production um, as well. So this is something that would be significantly remedied by electronic returns to order. Um, which we hope that the government will eventually agree to implement. It's the only real solution to the situation. Yeah, yeah. Thanks very much. Okay, last call for questions or comments. All right. Um, <clears throat> thank you very much for participating um, and providing us um, with some uh, better understanding and maybe a fair bit of thought food for thought for some of our jurisdictions in in how we continue to address this um, our parliaments in this pandemic 
thanks for your time and for your puppy's time in there as well. We've I apologise for my puppy, but she likes to <laughs> Don't do that. <laughs> the light entertainment. Okay. Thanks very much, Adam, and um, uh, we hope you continue to participate online. Thank you. Okay, members, that um, delegate set brings us to um, the end of this session. So delegates, uh, online delegates, we'll see you um, back at 1.30 online um, where we continue with a, a virtual address. Delegates in the chamber, uh, if you would like to uh, follow the honorary secretary um, immediately to the front steps of Parliament House for our f official photo uh, photograph and then return to the courtyard for lunch. We've got, um, who have we got here for, have we got some? Have we got at lunch? Have we got lunch in the courtyard? Yeah, okay, yeah. good, okay. Oh, that's tomorrow.